My first experience with Dune was seeing the paperback covers of this wild series on my mother's bookshelf as a kid. Drawn by the illustrator John Schoenher, who in many ways influenced the look and mystique of the Dune universe better than almost anyone else, these images, usually of small robed figures dwarfed by massive objects, statues, spaceships, and sand dunes, mirrored my own feelings. I felt like one of these tiny characters standing in fear of these enigmatic books. What could they possibly contain? I think I actually saw David Lynch's film version of Dune before I read the book and its sequel, Dune Messiah, and I ended up watching Lynch's film twice this weekend, and in anticipation of seeing part two of Denis Villeneuve's remake, I thought I might make a short video and offer my thoughts about a movie that I can't say that I love, but I do appreciate and have seen many times. Obviously, this movie is somewhat notorious, disowned by its director, a critical and commercial flop upon its release, but I'd like to use my time today to discuss all the things I really like and enjoy about the movie, as well as reasons why I've been drawn to Frank Herbert's Dune universe uh, throughout the years. So without further ado, let's get started. There'll be some spoilers as I run through a quick summary right now. Dune is the story of the Atreides family from the planet Kaladin. Paul, the son of Duke Leto, and Leto's concubine Jessica, a member of a secret order of witches, the Bene Gesserit. Paul lives out his days in preparation, studying, learning combat techniques from his various teachers, training his mind and body to assume the role he is destined for, that of Duke. I imagine Paul knows that responsibility is coming for him once his father dies, but Paul's ascension to the throne is many years off. He has time, or so he thinks. The family is called to the desert planet of Arrakis, where they will oversee the production of the Spice Melange, a psychoactive drug that provides superhuman abilities to certain people, like the Spacing Guild, who use the spice to fold space, i.e. travel at light speed. The Atreides are taking over control of the planet from their sworn enemies, House Harkonnen, who have been unceremoniously evicted after 80 years. Though the family suspects danger in this new opportunity, they could scarcely have imagined that the Emperor of the Universe is plotting to overthrow the increasingly popular house, sever their bloodline, and decimate their forces in order to stem any threat to his rule. And the Harkonnens will be the Emperor's hand in this violent deception, enlisting a traitor amongst the ranks of the Atreides to sabotage their defense systems and leave them open for attack. Duke Leto is killed, and Paul and Jessica escape to the desert, their kingdom in ruins. After narrowly avoiding a confrontation with one of the massive, godlike sandworms that traverse the endless deserts of Arrakis, Paul and his mother encounter the Fremen, a mysterious cave-dwelling people who have perfected the art of survival in this harsh environment. Paul appears to them as a prophetic figure. He has inherited from his mother the abilities of the Bene Gesserit, the first man able to harness the technique of the voice. Once he proves his worth by riding one of the dreaded sandworms, the prophecy is sealed. He must be the storied Nisan al-Gaib. Paul rallies his new Fremen allies to attack and they take back the palace at Arakeen, thwarting all who betrayed them. After fighting in knife combat with the Baron's evil nephew, Fade Rautha, Paul proves he can muster the Bene Gesserit voice, not only to influence people, but to inflict physical damage. He is not to be trifled with. And suddenly it begins for the first time ever to reign on the desert planet of Arrakis. As Paul is clothed in a robe and becomes emperor of the known universe, the first male Bene Gesserit, the prophesied Kwisatz Haderach. For he is the Kwisatz Haderach. Oh, and uh, Paul's mother drank from the water of life, had a baby daughter who grew incredibly rapidly and possesses thousands of years of generational knowledge and special powers. Paul's sister. Paul is my deep. I, I think that's it. Okay, so Dune had a long and storied journey to the big screen. Based on Frank Herbert's 1965 book, many artists attempted to stage an adaption before Dino De Laurentiis got his hands on it. They tried and failed? They tried and died. Okay, maybe not, but the movies did die. The first guy to purchase the rights to Dune was our friend Arthur P. Jacobs, the determined producer of Planet of the Apes, who, one year before his untimely death, sold the rights to a consortium of French investors planning to produce avant-garde Chilean filmmaker Alejandro Jodorowsky's version. Famously unmade, there's a great documentary about it called Jodorowsky's Dune. Had that film come to fruition, we would have seen surrealist Salvador Dali playing the emperor securing a deal to be paid $1,000 a minute. 
Orson Welles as the Baron Harkonnen, Mick Jagger as Fade Rautha, and this would have been cool, French La Samurai actor Alain Delon as badass fan favorite Duncan Idaho, who, portrayed by Richard Jordan in Lynch's version, receives a criminally small amount of screen time. All this in an original score by Pink Floyd. This package proved too good to be true. And after Jodorowsky failed to compile all the funding he needed, the rights were scooped up by 5'4 Italian producer and often described gangster Dino De Laurentiis, who had recently had success with, and to his credit, was willing to stage and sink money into fantasy and science fiction themed projects, like his remake of King Kong and Conan the Barbarian. Dino had been eyeing the rights for some time, the book being a favorite of his son, Federico, who tragically died in a plane crash. It's at least moderately understandable as to why Dino picked David Lynch to direct. Eraserhead, Lynch's film school effort, had turned a lot of heads, gotten a lot of attention. The attention, most notably, of Mel Brooks, who hired him to direct The Elephant Man, a beautiful and haunting movie that was showered with critical praise. George Lucas was even interested in hiring Lynch to direct Return of the Jedi, which I think might not have been a great fit, but there's been speculation that Lynch even took the meetings with Lucas in order to sort of create buzz around himself in Hollywood as a hot commodity, maybe even using the speculation that he would be doing another project to leverage his payday for Dune. The one question I've always had is why Lynch was interested in directing Dune in the first place, and for the most part, I've never really gotten a satisfactory answer, to my knowledge, from Lynch himself. Lynch was interviewed on the set by a journalist asking what it felt like to have this massive operation mustered in order to achieve his vision, to have a massive cast, hundreds of prop men and special effects people and set builders and extras all marshaled for him. Lynch replied, they're not here for me, they're here for Dune, which seems to imply that David felt himself a cog in the machine, a servant of the material. Maybe Lynch did the movie at the behest of his agents, like, Hey, this is your next move, kid. One for them, one for you. We see this all the time now with the Marvel movies. Taking a hot up-and-comer and handing him the keys in order ultimately that he helps shepherd a piece of a giant machine rather than really guide the ship. And the production of Dune was a large, unwieldy ship, to be sure. Dino sent the production to Mexico to save money, which he would ultimately do with Conan the Destroyer as well. By all accounts, the Mexican crew did yeoman's work to construct the massive sets, of which there were 41 in total. They portrayed many of the Fremen extras, sealed into rubber suits in the middle of the desert for hours. Many of them suffered heat stroke and were paid in shoes. Sickness was so rife amongst the cast and crew that Dino had food sent in from Italy, and oftentimes the prop and costume department had to send double the supplies in the mail, considering more than half of their shipments got held up in the corrupt customs departments, who made a habit of demanding money for their release. Lynch was reportedly an incredibly even-keeled director, patient, calm, but did seem to suffer under the strain of this undertaking, sometimes dodging confrontation and the never-ending barrage of questions hurtled at him day to day. Perhaps the element that most interested Lynch was the opportunity to build four very elaborate worlds with their own distinct visual motifs. This ultimately, Bob Ringwood's costume design, Anthony Master's set design, is the most intriguing and gratifying aspect of the film for me. We have Caladan, the Atreides homeworld. The edict was to make everything out of wood, organic material. It's cozy, the castle smattered with rain, inside warm and rich. I also love the Atreides uniforms, the regal dark green military dress, adorned in gold and red. Kaitan, the base of operations for the Emperor, gaudily laid in gold and ornate stalagmites inspired by European cathedrals. The scene in which the Spacing Guild arrives, an incredibly memorable moment as men in costumes made out of body bags stride in with this massive black tank and a hideous monster glides out of the fog. Arrakis and the Palace of Arakeen, beautifully tiled and colorful. Color something which Villeneuve's film eschews in favor of large, abstract shapes, brutalist cement elements, and simplicity in the design. Which initially I didn't much like. It seemed too Spartan, uninspired. But in hindsight, this allows the more complicated elements of the plot and character motivations and scenes to breathe without competing for attention. You can tell, though, when watching the movie, that Lynch had the most fun with the Harkonnen world of Gady Prime, the scene in which we are introduced to the Baron, actor Kenneth McMillan, 
who would often leave the set and go out to restaurants with his grotesque pustule makeup still applied, and his two nephews, Paul L. Smith as the Beast Ramon, who at one point might have been played by director John Milius, who had just worked with producer Rafaela de la Rentes on Conan, and Sting, a miraculous get for the production, as there was just about nobody hotter at the time than the police. Sting is cool in this film. His costume is badass, with that sort of big Roy Batty collar, and he's kind of playfully over the top. I will kill him! His beefcake moment, obviously a play to the teen girl crowd, gleefully undercut by Lynch, as he is ogled by his blood-sucking pedophile uncle. These scenes remind me a lot of Blue Velvet and Frank Booth's coterie of ne'er-do-wells. Rock and roll iconography, simpering sycophants to the loudest evil guy in the room, impressed as he holds court with his hedonism. Inhuman characters reliant on prosthetics and medical devices. We even get the tulips, wildly incongruous to the surroundings of steel and oil, similar to the opening of Lynch's next film. As far as the special effects work goes, much of it is quite beautiful. There are incredible matte paintings done by veteran artist Albert Whitlock, but much of the work is undercut by half-baked shots like these that just look terrible. Industrial Light and Magic was far too busy working on Return of the Jedi to take up any work on Dune, and ultimately the undercooked special effects were the result of Raffaella De Laurentiis dropping John Dykstra's Apogee Studios shortly before pre-production and instead working with an in-house team which is unfortunate considering Apogee's storyboard work for the special effects would have produced really spectacular results. Scenes of folding space that were incredibly psychedelic and interesting, and also a much more elaborate and exciting battle sequence at the film's climax. The first act of Dune is pretty great. The production design is so sumptuous and engrossing that even if you don't exactly understand what's going on, there's much to appreciate, and the core story foundation is there. McLaughlin, a total unknown at the time, who actually beat out Val Kilmer and Tom Cruise for the role, has an incredibly likable boyish quality, but is able to summon the regality and authority required for him in the third act. You, you mustn't speak. <laughs> Something I've always loved about Dune is the relationship Paul has with all the military men in the Atreides dynasty. It's not the kind of relationship we often see in modern media. A young liege whose family has inspired such devotion and affection from their subjects. The loyalty of Gurney Halleck and Thufir Hawat and Duncan Idaho. This was an element I expected to be tabled somewhat in the new film, as it's rather undemocratic, let's say. This sort of fealty to a duke that extends to his son. But to my surprise, it was. My lady, Paul, I'm so sorry. Your father. We know. My lord duke. Obviously, Paul has not earned this devotion. His father has. But rather than being a sort of rags-to-riches story as we so often see, the nobody plucked from obscurity, the callow youth who rises to the occasion, Dune is instead a story about a boy born into privilege, whose story arc is earning that privilege, proving himself to be worthy of his father, his legacy, his birthright. Interesting, though, too, and unique is the strong maternal connection. Often in sci-fi fantasy, the powers or abilities of the son is patrilineal, or the absence or influence of a father is the driving motivation for a hero. Whereas in Dune, everything supernatural about Paul is the result of him being his mother's son, the son she was forbidden to have. Paul inherits the power of the Bene Gesserit, who are an all-female order. In the end, he supersedes even the rank of Duke, the birthright of his father, and takes up instead the mantle of his mother. There's a catch here, though, and one the film hesitates to take head on opting instead to leave the audience feeling good. In the novel, Paul never made it rain on Arrakis. He is, in a sense, a false idol. He possesses powers from the Bene Gesserit, which fit the messianic ideas sown into the culture of the Fremen many thousands of years ago by the Witching Order, a practice called the Missionera Protectiva. This is a cool concept, and one we've seen repeated in movies like Matrix 2, where the rebel against the system is really just a product of the system. The movie, however, while really trying to stay true to the book, truncates much of the second and third act into a four-quadrant science fiction battle, and ultimately the movie feels like it sort of runs out of steam once the Fremen arrive. It's kind of all boilerplate. We train up the good guys to fight back, and we win the big battle. Some stuff happens, and we get some trippy imagery, etc., but I think the movie was reluctant, 
having been cut down from three hours to two hours and 17 minutes, to heap more information or potentially confusing science fiction musings on its reportedly already confused audience. An audience who it was thought, by probably some marketing person, needed to be presented with a pamphlet glossary of terms before entering the theater. No doubt, test screenings led to the inclusion of many unnecessary voiceover moments in the movie, which pull you out of the story entirely and are often really poorly done. This is what I'll do to the Duke and his family. I think as audience members, we are more trained today to work to understand science fiction and fantasy epics, and audiences don't balk at being confronted with terminology or world building anymore. For instance, I was always quite taken with this idea, foundational to Herbert's novels, and not touched on in either film, really, of the Butlerian Jihad, a core element of backstory to the Dune universe that most computing power and artificial intelligence had been banned, snuffed out by a massive war of humanity against machines some 10,000 years before the events of Dune. Unlike something like Star Trek, which offers a liberal utopia of increasingly prosperous democracy aided by the perpetual perfection and integration of technology, Dune takes the opposite track of reversing the course of history. Instead, computing has been outsourced to special classes of human beings, mentats, who achieve the power of computers through consumption of spice and other organic materials that help to extend their minds. Dune is very much a product of the 1960s, and even an anecdotal experience of Frank Herbert when he accidentally took LSD in Mexico before writing the book. I love these elements, and so far no Dune adaption has really wrangled with them. These are the sort of complex science fiction ideas, the Missionera Protectiva, the Butlerian Jihad, that I think are conveyed best in Schoenher's Dune novel covers that I discussed earlier. The idea of being a little figure dwarfed by history, a passing piece of such a large and sprawling narrative, which we do see in the remainder of Herbert's books as they span tens of thousands of years, the story of Paul Atreides being the tip of the iceberg. Dune, I'm glad, sort of lives on as a cult film because of all the unique elements, craftsmanships, and visionary design that doesn't exactly come together as a whole, and the reason for the film's failure is so intangible. It's sort of unfortunate that this film got so shellacked after its release because there is really a lot to enjoy here. Uh, again, I mentioned at the beginning that I've seen the movie multiple times. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a great time capsule to that era of sort of Star Wars ripoffs, so I hate to use that phrase. But um, it does fail to capture a lot of those really large science fiction expansive elements that I think are really summarized well by John Schoenher and his art, the uh, covers of the books that so captivated me to begin with. And I'll, I'll leave, remains to be seen whether or not Denis Villeneuve will be able to pull that off with his sequel, Dune Part 2, which I'm sure we'll all go to see and enjoy in IMAX this weekend. Um, I put this video out basically to capitalize on the hype machine along with that film. But it was one that I felt it was on the shelf as movies that I could potentially talk about. So I hope you enjoyed it. One more thing I wanted to mention was uh, – I just don't really like Toto's score for the film. I mean, it reminds me a lot of like Vince DiCola's score for another Dino De Laurentiis production, uh, Transformers the Movie. Just sort of like boilerplate 80s. I think a lot of the songs just hit a sour note. That doesn't feel grand, doesn't feel epic. It feels like the soundtrack to a video game. And uh, I know that for the, the, a certain theme in the film, uh, Lynch enlisted Brian Eno, whose recent album of sort of ambient sounds, he, um, he found very engaging and he brought Eno in to do an uncredited, uncredited track on the soundtrack. I wish he would have, you know, found out about Eno earlier and brought him in to begin with. That would have been badass because one of my favorite movie soundtracks of all time scores is, uh, you know, for Last Temptation of Christ. I think that's just terrific. So um, thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, revisit David Lynch's Dune, as I'm sure you might be. Thanks again. If you'd like to support my work, you can check me out on Patreon and consider donating for a $1 to $3 tier. You can get a lot of new extras and fun things. But I really appreciate you tuning in. See you next time. Oh, wait. I forgot to tell you. My long goodbye review is still on its way. I know a lot of you guys were excited about seeing that. It just got jumped in line in favor of Dune because, hey, I'm trying to get those clicks, baby. Oh.